and has enormous potential to inspire young students to go into careers in math and science, not just in space, but in math and science overall. And I think we need to work very hard to find creative ways to engage those students in ways that are going to be captivating for them. I recently had a fascinating experience. I gave a talk to 20,000 uh, young middle school and high school students, from, mostly from underprivileged uh, school districts in uh, Detroit. I did it at Ford Field where the Detroit Lions played. I was lined up on the 10-yard line between the hash marks with the, the end zone filled with, with middle school students and showing pictures that had come down from Mars four, year, four, four, four hours before on the Jumbotron screen. They were captivated. They get turned on by this. And if we can take what we do and the passion that we all feel for what we do in space and we can find creative ways to reach those people, it's an enormous resource out there. It really is. I agree very much with my colleagues on this topic, but let me add one other nuance here and, and an issue that we face, and that is that the timetables today are getting to be so long for these space missions, decade or more, that it's difficult to attract students uh, into these programs because the timetable for building these instruments is well beyond the typical tenure of a student either at undergraduate or a graduate level. And so they don't have a chance to to fly these missions, if you will, while they're in school. So we have a, a problem that is it's making it difficult to attract new instrumentalists who will build the next generation of spacecraft uh, sensors or imagers, and it's something that uh, we need to face. I think Dr. Stern is is helping by re-implementing. We almost drove the balloon and the rocket program out of existence. And so this is very helpful in that regard, but we really need to do much more. Thank the panel for, for some really important insights into this crucial area of how do we recruit uh, young people into this, these important fields and then how do we retain them and give them a sense that uh, this is very worthwhile. The chair recognizes, again, the gentleman from California for five minutes. I would uh, just note that uh, unless our children have a uh, good uh, foundation in science and mathematics, uh, that you're not going to be able to recruit them later on. And uh, let me just note that uh, all the hearings that I've had, especially the yesterday with Gates, it's very clear that there is such a hesitation uh, to confront the political problem of permitting science and mathematics teachers to receive more pay than the teachers of other subjects. And a pay differential is the fundamental issue that's going to either make us successful in giving these fundamental skills or not because you've got dozens of people who want to teach English literature and history and uh, they frankly don't for every one person that you can maybe attract to teach science and mathematics and the science and mathematics people can make a lot more money doing doing something else rather than teaching so we need to pay them more money and there was a there was a uh, uh, there, there was a movie called, yeah, and I remember they said, it was about a baseball, I said, build it and they will come. Well, pay more money and they will come. And uh, unfortunately, that's, there's a major political impasse in that certain political people have relied on unions and the educational unions, which are, would rather hold America back than give up the right to have every teacher in every subject has to be paid exactly the same amount of money. That's the fundamental problem we face there. I was also mentioned uh, someone seeing the light at the end of the, the tunnel. I hope when they're looking through a telescope, the light at the end of the tunnel isn't a near-Earth object headed in our direction. And I think someday it will be. And uh, I understand there's even been some near-Earth objects that have, you know, they come so infrequently, but there happened to have been one just a short while ago that came uh, between the Earth and the moon. That close, we didn't even know it was there until after it had gone by. And um, I think that it's worth our while to be able to look out. And by the way, that's also something that I've, we actually passed some legislation, gives awards to young people who, if they look into the skies and discover some near-Earth object, we give them a reward, an award. Uh, I think a Pete Conrad Award that I authored the bill that, that permits us and uh, gives this award every year to a young person that discovers some object. So that's a good way of getting young people involved as well. Uh, let me ask, it was mentioned about uh, earlier, and I believe it was you that was talking about the discovery of, of planets, uh, outer planets or something that NASA's doing? Uh, 
Congressman Robarker, I think, yes. exoplanets, is that uh, yes. what you're referring to around yeah. other star systems? Yeah, how much are we spending discovering these extra planets? Well, I have to uh, talk to, I have to turn to Dr. Stern because I don't know those numbers off the uh, top no. of my head, but we've got a, a new mission which is going to be launched next year called Kepler uh, that is uh, going to be dedicated to looking for new stars. Right now, based on uh, ground-based uh, uh, observations, over 250 planets are known to now exist around other star systems. The question that I want, need to answer here is, why are we willing to, this is obviously an expensive proposition, why are we willing to, to, to launch a new program that's going to cost money to find out about planets from distant stars when we're not willing to spend even more than $3 million a year trying to find near-Earth objects that may or may not hit the Earth and kill millions of people? I think that's for me. Yes. <laughs> Well, let me say that um, uh, in executing our exoplanets program, uh, we're following the recommendations of the uh, National Academy. Thanks. It's a very exciting program. Uh, we have a number of spacecraft that we're turning to that task, and we're building Kepler. How much is that going to Looking cost? forward to future programs. Yeah. How much will that cost? Well, uh, that, uh, those missions are typically in the Kepler cost class, and they're six, $800 million. Now, Mr. Now, Mr. Chairman, let's just note, $600, 800000000 million, and we're quibbling over whether or not we're going to really have uh, a program that can really take care of, of charting all of the, the uh, near-Earth objects uh, in, in a very quick time just to see if one of them might hit the Earth, and quibbling over a $5 million telescope, which may, and I'm going to look into this, which may or may not play an essential role. If it doesn't play an essential role, I'm going to take that back, and I'll call my friends at Cornell and uh, uh, tell them I got the wrong information last time we held a hearing. I do seem to remember, Mr. Chairman, last time we held a hearing, all of the witnesses told us how vital this uh, telescope was, but to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to find a planet in distant stars and not be willing to, it just seems Mr. to Mr. Rohrbacher, if I, if I may, I'd like sure. to tell you about our NEO program because okay. uh, uh, it's an exciting program as it's well. About, how many, it's a $3 million program, well, is we, it not? It, it's, it's commonly referred to as a $3 million program. In fact, um, because we were lagging in our goal that the Congress set to finish by 19, the end of 2008, right. detecting 90% of all the kilometer class potentially hazardous objects uh, near the Earth, I actually um, took some of my discretionary funds and helped that program um, along this year. So it's actually be funded a little bit higher level than that. But I want to also point out that's not the only way that we study near Earth asteroids. We have programs in fundamental research in our planetary science division. We've flown a mission to orbit and then land on a near Earth asteroid. I was there when they did, yes, called great. Near. You're yeah, probably right. familiar with that mission. Sure, I think terrific. its cost level was uh, several hundred million dollars. I, I think it was about $250 million. We have a mission on its way, although not to a near Earth asteroid, um, to orbit two of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt. We have a whole variety of programs that address the nature of um, asteroids, their composition, their structure. This all helps inform us about. Um, the near-Earth asteroid problem in one way or another, and we are doing the program that the Congress asked us to do, and I expect us to, to meet that goal by the end of 2008. Very good answer. Thank you. Thank you, gentleman from California. I want to recognize the gentleman from Florida for a comment. Yes, I'll be brief, and then, and then I know the chairman has some questions, and then, but I'll be done for the, for the day after this. I, I have a big interest in the near-Earth object issue as well. I note a couple things. Number one, uh, um, some scientists believe 64 million years or so, again, dinosaurs and other entities went extinct around the, the planet because of a near-Earth uh, object actually colliding. We actually had a big one, I think, in 1908 in sub Siberia that would have been um, uh, catastrophic. Uh, so these things do occur, and I think that uh, Congressman uh, Rohrbacher's concerns are genuine. I would point out that I think if I remember the testimony...